welcome to Wine, Women, and Writing Radio, where we talk about stories with complex, authentic female characters, the real sometimes stories and real women those are based on, and how this translates into great fiction. We do this with sometimes some oversharing, a little irreverence, maybe some profanity if you're lucky, and um, vast quantities of whatever gets us through the day. Um, it's only uh, early morning out in the Pacific Northwest, so our guest today probably is not drinking wine yet, but today oh. we're lucky to have Bob Digoni, Robert Digoni, to talk about his latest Tracy Crosswhite mystery, A Steep Price, and I'm really excited about it because I'm a fan. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, the most important question first is whether or not you're a wine drinker. So um, what's your poison? Uh, red wine over white wine. Uh, I'm not a connoisseur of any, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I just know what I like. Uh, we were talking off the air a little bit. I was just, uh, on vacation and I was sitting out, uh, around a fire pit and friends of ours had just returned from Spain and they had ordered a case of their favorite wine there. And so we were drinking Spanish red wine, uh, looking out over beautiful Hoods Canal. Uh, it was, it was wonderful. It was a great, great experience. It sounds absolutely fabulous. Everything's better outside and with a campfire in my world. So, you know, bring me that. Does Do you picture Tracy Crosswhite, um, your protagonist, as a wine drinker? Um, you know, I was I, – I think she's had some wine when she gets home and Dan pours it for her. Uh, so, you know, after a tough day at the office, I could definitely see her being a wine drinker, but I could also see her bring, being a whiskey drinker. I could see that, too. I could definitely see a Dan, who is, is the perfect husband, you know, cooking her dinner, et cetera, opening a bottle and pouring it for her and her not saying no. I think I've seen a scene or two where that's happened. I think I you're think, right. I think I've seen – I picture her more as a whiskey drinker as well. Um before we were on the air, as Bob mentioned, we were chatting a little bit, and I was telling him that I listen to his books on audio, and that because I curate my husband's audio co- collection, he's a triathlete, and he listens to them while he trains, I have got him hooked on Bob Dugoni, and he's listened to every single one of your books, and that we absolutely love the um, voice narrator, Emily Sutton Smith. I think she does a great job on that. But you were also telling me uh, about a recent experience that you'd had where you have a book that you narrated yourself. And I would love if you'd tell us a little bit about that. Sure. No, I, Emily is uh, is fantastic. Um, and so I would, I, you know, I would never even try to do the Tracy Crosswhite books. I could never do as well as she does. But I got asked to do uh, a book that I wrote called The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell. Uh, it's a very personal book. It's not autobiographical at all, but it's about a young boy who grows up with ocular albinism, which means he has red eyes. It's been compared very much to John Irving's A Prayer for Owen Meany. Uh, it's about this young boy who grows up in the 60s. He can't change the color of his eyes, and he's bullied. Uh, he's bullied at school. He's bullied by kids. He's bullied by the teachers. Uh, and his mother is this very devout Catholic woman who is just very resolute throughout, and um and is constantly telling him, you're going to lead an extraordinary, you have extraordinary eyes because you're going to lead an extraordinary life. And in the midst of her, him hearing this, all he sees is the, the negatives that come with it. So in any event, when I turned the book in, Lake Union, my publisher asked if I would be interested in narrating it. And uh, I'm an old actor. Uh, and so I thought it would just be a kick in the pants. Uh, it was difficult to get back to Brilliance Audio. It was back in Grand Haven, Michigan, but I made it my way back there. I had talk to more experienced narrators and they had said it's a lot of work it's really hard you're you're in a studio booth all day your producer is on the other side of the glass and you know you're just constantly starting and stopping starting and stopping i loved it i loved it from the moment i started it to the moment we got to the very end um i thought the whole thing was fantastic you know to be able to play every character uh, in the book uh including the first person narrator to me was really um, one of the one of the most special things that I that I've done it in my life. I had a great producer director and Ken Schmidt uh, who really helped me to do the female character voices uh, without making them um, stereotypical and those kinds of things. Um, and I you know I didn't know how it went. I just I did my best. 
And I found out after the fact that um, I won a Golden Mike Award, uh, which is the highest award you can get for a narrator. And uh, that meant a that meant a tremendous amount to me. I love that you were an old actor. A lot of um, authors would find it intimidating, but for instead it to be something that was like, yes, an opportunity to play all the parts. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. And, um, you know, I, when I look back on it, I don't, I would not want, I would not have wanted anyone else to narrate that book uh, because it was, it was such a, um, uh, it was such a personal book. Uh, at the same time, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the woman who narrates my Tracy Crosswhite novel. She just, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Emily Sutton is her name, and she is fantastic. And I would never, I wouldn't, I could never do as good a job as she could do. So, you know, when you find that right narrator, it's really special. Well, we've really enjoyed um, and her, her narration, and I also listened to you with Sam Hell. So great job, and congratulations on a fantastic book and on uh, winning the Golden Mike. That's Thank pretty you. cool. Thank you. Well, we'll switch back to from from what I think of as more literary fiction, more your John Irving kind of hat, to your um, Tracy Crosswhite books, which are delicious and addictive, and you know you have to keep reading one after the other. Um, and I want to hear before even we talk about Steep Price. What made you start writing a female detective? How did that come to be? Because I think your previous protagonist had been male. David, David Stone, male. Mm -hmm. And the books were very male dominated. Um, two things happened. One was um, when, I, when, I, when I decided I was gonna write a new series, I was looking for a character. And, uh, and I called my agent up and I had written a book called Murder One in the David Sloan series. And in there were two homicide detectives, uh, Kensington Rowe, a former football player with a bad hip and Tracy Crosswhite. And so I called my agent up and I said, um, okay, I, I know the spinoff character I want. And then I wanted to write a spinoff character on Kensington Row. Mm -hmm. And my agent thought about it. Um, uh, Meg Rooley at the Jane Rott Rosen agency. She thought about it. She thought about it. And she said, let me get back to you. So she called me back and she said, what about Tracy Crosswhite? And I said, what about Tracy Crosswhite? And she said, well, why is she a chemistry teacher? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and she said, well, maybe you should find out. We think that everybody here thinks that she could really be a terrific character. So that was the start of it, is I started to figure out why why was this character of mine a, a former high school chemistry teacher? And what was her background? And where was she from? And um, and I just, I kind of just started. And, and the question I always get is... Um, did you try, did you, was it difficult writing from the perspective of a woman? And my response is always the same. I say, I don't write from the perspective of a woman. I think that would be a fatal mistake. I'm not a woman. I would be, you know, I would not be able to do it. I have a lot of women in my life. I have four sisters. I have a professional mom. I have a professional wife. I work, worked with a lot of professional women. So I have a lot of women that can help me. Um, but really what I tried to do is I tried to write from the perspective of a character who's been through a, a horrific uh, background background experience and she's trying to recover. And, you know, whether she's male or female, on those circumstances really doesn't matter. She's a human being who's um, who's trying to create a life for herself after a, after a horrific tragedy has stolen her sister. And one of the things I love about Tracy is I've read where men have tried to, to write from the perspective of a woman and comes off wooden. They're overly feminine in some ways, or the mark is just missed in others. And Tracy's just, she's a person. She's a real person with real issues. She is believable. She's based upon the sum of her parts and not on one characteristic, right? And, and yeah. Being female is just one of her many attributes. So I, I love that you did it that way. And it's funny that, um, that your agent prodded you a little bit to go in that direction because, you know, the, the chemistry thing is a fun and wonderful thing that comes in handy for storylines. And you had all those books with the great exploration of the horrific events that, that set her on the path that she's, right. she's on. So. I love it. Um, so with this particular book, A Steep Price, 
uh, was there any circumstances that stimulated this particular book or did this one just come out of the fertile imagination of Bob Degoni? Well, what, um, what led us to a steep price? Um, it's actually, it's actually a really interesting story. I was, uh, traveling to the Bay Area to visit my mom. Uh, and I take an Uber because my mom is older now and doesn't like to drive at the airport. And so I was taking an Uber, uh, to get to her house. And the, the, there was a young man driving, 21 years old. Uh, and, uh, we were chatting and he had told me that he was newly married. And, and I was saying, congratulations. And I said, did you know your wife for a long time? And he said, no, actually, I, I, uh, the, I met her about a week before we got married and I married her on that day. And I, I was stunned and I wasn't thinking arranged marriage. I was just thinking, holy cow, uh, love at first sight. And I said, wow. I said, that's really quick. And then he told me it was an arranged marriage. And I asked him, I said, were you, were you terrified to marry someone you hardly knew? And he told me he wasn't because his parents were, uh, the product of an arranged marriage. And then he started telling me other things like, um, the divorce rate among arranged marriages is actually much lower than in the United States, traditional marriages, et cetera, et cetera. And so when he dropped me off, I, uh, I went into my mother's office. She still works. She's 85. She's still an accountant. Uh, she's a really amazing lady. And I found an empty computer terminal and I just started doing research. And I wanted to write a story that involved uh, Vic Fazio, one of Tracy's partners. I had right. done a book that had Kensington Row in it um, a little more heavily. I had done the, the prior one. Uh, a Trap Girl had um, uh, Del uh, Castigliano in it. So I wanted to, to tell a little bit about more who Foz was and his marriage. And his marriage was a blind date. You know, he, he met Vera on a blind date and they ended up getting married. So the stories just sort of started to mesh together. Yes. And uh, But it really started with a cab drive. That's wonderful. I, I um, Ubered to see my mother-in-law um a week or two ago and had a cab driver that was basically trying to not cab driver, Uber driver that was trying to pitch me stories the whole time, but <laughs> none of them stuck. So I really like yours. I want, I want that Uber driver or something. <laughs> <like. laughs> um, so with this book, you've covered so much ground with Tracy already as far as what, uh, what we might call women's issues, you know, things that um, particularly interest are about women. And, and that makes sense because, Tracy's a girl. Um, so this one, you're stimulated into a new direction. You've got the arranged marriage. You've got uh, pregnancy at work in a male-dominated field. Um, you've got uh, women's health issues going on in it. You have um, a split between best friends. You've got a female antagonist. You really had it going on in this one with women's issues. Um, and I kind of want to break those down a little bit. You've already told the story about how the arranged marriage came to be and the blind date tying in with, with Vic and his wife, Vera. But you also got pretty serious with, with Vic and Vera this time with her issue. And what made you go down the road of serious health issues here with those two? Did that just uh, organically happen or? Yeah, no, my, you know, my, um, my mom's a breast cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, she got it when she was 60 years old. Um, she's a tough cookie, my mom. Uh, she would go and do her chemotherapy on Fridays and she'd go back to work on Monday. Uh, she's, a she's, a, she's a tough cookie. Uh, and then I have a, um, a cousin who lost his wife about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, wonderful, really Lisa was wonderful, wonderful, um, woman and she died of breast cancer. Um, you know, breast cancer is a huge health issue in this country. And I had someone tell me one time that if, if testicular cancer was as big a um, health issue as breast cancer, there'd be a cure for it. Yeah. And that, that's pretty sad to think when you think of that, um, because there are uh, there it's, it's really become much more prevalent. So um, I wanted to write a book in which uh, Faz, I mean, Vera is Faz's life. And it's, I, I hope it's apparent in the book that, you know, they are, it's, it's Vera and Faz. They're not, they're, they are like one entity. Uh, their marriage is very strong and, and he loves her and she's really his life. Uh, they have one child together. And uh, here in the middle of this horrific case that he's attempting, that he's the lead detective on, um, Vera discovers a lump in her breast 
and she discovers she has uh, uh, breast cancer and she begins treatment. Um, and I, so I, you know, I, I like, I like my characters to have two lives, which we all do. I like them to have a professional life and I like them to have a personal life. And personal lives are often complicated and difficult, uh, even amongst the most happily married or the most happily, uh, you know, together couples that you'll find. It's, it, it's not easy. Um, and, and I didn't want it to be easy for, for Faz. I wanted it to be difficult. And I think you did a beautiful job with that. I mean, it's the human condition, right? It's not um, nobody promises us, is us easy. And and I loved how it did bleed over and, and put so much pressure on him. You know, you you beat him up pretty good in this one. <laughs> he, he I did. Time. Yeah, poor Foz. <laughs> I love him. I've loved him in all the books. So it was fun to get to spend a little bit more time with the two of them and their relationship and get a small glimpse into their son as well. Um, it is amazing the with with women's health issues and how so many of them, breast cancer just being one, there are only recently some of these enormous strides and, and so much room left to go. It's still the great mystery. And Hopefully, we'll keep seeing a lot of pressure on those to be solved. Um, so with the, with the other um, big issue to me in the book was, of course, what, what Tracy is going through. Um, okay, so her age. She's pregnant in this book. How old yeah. is Tracy? I don't even remember. I think she's 42. So she's a mature pregnant woman, for starters, which is challenging, and in a... Uh, workplace where it's not necessarily easy. No. It's easy anywhere to be pregnant. Um, but this one's been coming for a while, this, this pregnancy. Um, I'm thinking we got a hint of it in, in the last book. Um, but a lot of fun to be able to go through this. So with the respect to the pregnancy in the workplace, is this drawn on any real life experiences or was it just pushing and pulling on Tracy until you uh, found her in the place that she is. Um, it really arose out of the prior books and her prior relationship with her captain. Yeah. Uh, and and it, but also you know I, I I mentioned I think they have four sisters and and between them they probably have uh, fifteen children uh, yeah. kids. Um, and you know my wife uh, we have two children ourselves and um, you know it. it it's a di it's a different experience, um, and and so I um, a lot of times people think that you can be a you can be a professional woman or you can be a mother you can't be both, uh, and but you can be both, and it's really it's it's not it's not what the woman can do it's what society will accept and allow, and right. I think we've become a lot a lot more progressive than uh, certainly in in years past but I think there's still um, I think there's still strides that can be made. Um, I laugh because, uh, for instance, the law firm where I still keep an office and write from is dog friendly. And mm -hmm. I think to myself, I don't think I've ever heard of a workplace that was kid friendly. Right. Dog friendly, though, it, 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 it's there. Um, you know, the, pe the people that really understand, I think, understand uh, human condition best are places like Google and Microsoft and Amazon, which have uh, daycares on site. Right. Um, you know, Genentech down in the Bay Area in San Francisco, I remember going there and they have a workout facility. They have a daycare facility. They have uh, an eye facility. Well, why do they do that? Because the more you have at the facility, the more the people can stay and work. It's good for your employees. It's good for your business. Right. Yeah. You're and not so, spending all your time running around from one to the other. It's beautiful. Right. And so, um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think hopefully, you know, the, the trend is going to go to more toward, um, you know, uh, providing access for women and men to spend time with their kids when they're little before they go off to school and things like that. Uh, and, and they can... But in any event, that's neither here nor there. For Tracy, she's working in a in a place with chat. She has a chauvinistic boss. She's deathly afraid that he's looking at this as as the excuse he needs to get rid of her. He has hired a woman 
uh, to work in the A team, and she's there to take Tracy's place. She's Hispanic, so Tracy fears that when she comes back, he'll say, "Hey, I hired a Hispanic female. You know, how, why? How can this possibly be, you know, sexist?" Uh, and so she's dealing with that while she's dealing with her job, while she's dealing with being pregnant and all the things that come with that. Yeah, it's a nice pressure cooker for her. And it was fun because, you know, we have had this chauvinistic um, captain that's been a thorn in Tracy's side over and over. And this time we had a new wrinkle, which was a woman at work that's the one that's pushing Tracy's buttons. And and that felt very real to me because women aren't always very kind to each other and and so to have a little bit of that antagonism even if whichever way it goes in the end but at certain points in the book to have that antagonism um was a, a new thing for her to be dealing with and felt very real to me thank you i appreciate that you're very very welcome you know with um with respect to her pregnancy, I can't exactly see the Seattle PD anytime soon coming up with a on-site daycare for the female police officer. So you can anticipate, I'm sure, some fun stories in the future with now Tracy dealing with um, the the back end of a pregnancy, these children and all the joy they bring to our lives. But yet such a short period of time, you know, all of our kids, we have five and they're all grown now. And at the time and when they're little and as a working mom, it all feels like so much. Yeah. But it's all over for me. I, I still feel like a young woman. And you think that's just a blink in time. I'm so glad I had work circumstances. It didn't force me to miss it all. Yeah. Yeah. My, our, da- our youngest, our daughter is, is leaving for college. And, and I, I, I'm like terrified. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely terrified that, you know, she's, we're going to be empty nesters because it, you're right. It just seems like, you know, a couple of days ago, they were these little kids. And, and I tell, I tell my, I have uh, nieces and nephews now that are 30 years old and have kids. And I tell them anytime they complain, I say, I say, treasure these years. I mean, yeah. these, are the best, these are the best years of your life. I'm telling you. My, uh, we just married one off and, um, just got the pictures back and it really drives that home and and boy I tell you it's hard on dad when those daughters get married you just wait you just wait never seen my husband cry so much (laughs) in a good way (laughs) um so do you have a favorite Tracy book or Tracy scene are there any that stand out to you as the writer I I have a favorite book and I have a favorite scene uh, my favorite book is My Sister's Grave because it changed the lo- it changed the lives of my family members. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it, it just did. It, it uh, uh, Thomas and Mercer did such an incredible job selling that book. Um, that you know all the b- beautiful things that come with that. Um, it, it changed my life. It changed it changed my family's life. Um, I write full time now, which is my passion. I, I I tell people I am I'm so blessed. To be able to do what I love to do on a on a regular basis, all and and uh, so I, I'm greatly appreciative of that book because it, it provided so many wonderful things. My favorite scene, however, is in the Trap Girl when uh, Tracy wants Tracy wants to be swept off her feet when she gets married, uh, and Dan uh, Dan arranges a uh, he and he proposes to her in a lighthouse which is really exists and which you really can do uh, here in Seattle. And boy, if I could get married again, or maybe, maybe for my, my wife's 25th wedding anniversary, maybe I'll see if I can, uh, if I can get that lighthouse and do what Dan did because it was pretty spectacular. It, it would give you big romantic husband points. Yeah, yeah I think it would. <laughs> that renewal on the 25th. That sounds good. <laughs> so you're a romantic then at heart. You picked a romantic scene as your favorite. Um, yeah, I would say that I am. Um, you know, like everybody, life often gets in the way and we have to stop and and uh and remember what's really important in our lives. And, you know, what's the most important thing in my life is my wife. But that's also the easiest thing to take for granted because sure. she's so capable. I mean, my wife is the most capable human being, male or female, I have ever met on the planet. She can ride a horse. She can drive a tractor. She can uh, parallel park a, uh, a horse trailer, a boat trailer. And yet 
she can then go inside and get dressed up and be the most beautiful woman at a party. You know, she's just she's just an amazing lady. And, and sometimes I know I take I take her for granted. And, and that's a mistake. Well, and, you know, a little crossover from real life to fiction. It, Dan faces that same um, that same thing with Tracy as well, doesn't he? A super capable woman who also is truly a woman. And it takes a hell of a guy to love a woman who's super capable. So hats off to Dan and to you and your wife. That's Thanks. awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, how long till 25 years? Have to have to know when we can all be sending these um, next, congratulations next, to the air. Next, next July. Oh, that's super. Yeah. That is super. Um, so, okay, a lot of what you've been telling me is pulling from elements of real life for for your stories. How much of you do you put in your books? Is there ever a character that's sort of Bob? Um, I think you know the answer to that question. Uh, I think every every writer that that has some success will will say the same thing, which is every character there is some of Bob in there. Um, yeah. I think if I was a woman, uh, you know, I would like to be Tracy Crossfire. I'd like to be capable. I'd like to be working a job that I love to do, uh, and, but to be treated equally and fairly. Um, you know, I think I think if I make mistakes and I take you know, someone for granted, uh, then I'm probably, uh, Nicasio, you know, the, her, her captain. Um, so, you know, that's the beauty of being a writer is, uh, we were talking off the air a little bit, you know, and I'm a, I'm a former actor, but the beauty of being a writer is you get, to, there's a little bit of you in every character you write. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes that scares the heck out of your spouse who reads your books and goes, Oh my God, where did you think of this horrible person? You know, uh, <laughs> I just kind of looked in the mirror and <laughs> one day. And there but, I mean, that, 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 that's that's the beauty of it. I mean, if, if you know all of my little idiosyncrasies, you know, I'm I'm claustrophobic. So if I want my character to really be in a terrifying situation, I would probably put her in a box, you know, and because I, I I would know what that 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 feeling, that anxious feeling you get mm -hmm. when you're when you're claustrophobic. Um, you know, all those little tiny things that. Uh, that make a character real. And, you know, I teach writing to, um, to other writers and, you know, I'll, I'll say to them, you know, what makes your character real? Cause you, you want to create a character that's, that's real, but larger than life. You know, how do you do that? And they'll all say, well, you know, the, the, the old standbys, right? The, the, the detective who's an alcoholic, uh, the person who's suffering from this. And I say, what about the little things that makes us all human? You know, the, not being able to sit on the middle seat of an airplane because you're claustrophobic. Uh, anxiety, mm -hmm. you know, uh, panic attacks. You know, I, I just had a conversation with someone who this person is, I thought, the most put together human being I'd, I'd ever met in my life. And, uh, you know, he revealed to me that he'd been off work for six months because he was having panic attacks. And, you know, it just makes yeah. him so real. And this is a guy that I would, I would create a character out of this guy. I mean, he's just, mm -hmm. he just com comes across as this big, macho, wonderful, you know, guy who's got it all together. We, none of us has it all together. None of yeah. us. Absolutely. And honestly, that's to me what makes, um, for, uh, great fiction is when you are able to find whatever it is that is the, not the weakness, but the vulnerability of that character. So I love it. Absolutely love it. And yeah, it is hard. It's hard to keep Bob or Pamela out of these, out of these books. And, and I don't know if it would be better if we could. So embrace it and go with it, right? Right. Um, so what's up next? Um, are you writing something now that we'll see soon? Or by the way, the reality of living in a cabin in the mountains is there is a fly that's I trying to that. land on these <laughs> video things. So I'm doing this. Sorry, everybody. I'm dancing. I'm dancing. Um, anyway, um, so what are you working on now? Um, thanks for asking. I just, uh, I just finished the development edits on a, on an espionage book of all things. Uh, um, so I'm, 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 I'm going back to my original series and I'm taking a character from that series who's a former CIA agent, Charles Jenkins, ex CIA agent living on an island here in the Pacific Northwest. And he gets pulled back into the CIA. He gets sent to Russia and everything he's been told is, is upside down and he finds himself running for his life. So how did I, how did I come about with this story? Well, again, it wasn't a cab drive, but. <laughs> uh, I had a guy that uh, was had got a hold of me several times and said, I have a, a story for you you might be interested in. 
I'm sure you've experienced this. Those are the people you definitely don't call back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, there was something about the earnestness of this guy's story that I looked him up, you know, on Google and everything. And, and um, he's was legitimate businessman, successful businessman, et cetera, et cetera. And so I decided what can it hurt? I went to have coffee with him. And right before I left, the short of a very long story is there was an article written in the 1980s, way down on the uh, on the on Google, about a former uh, CIA agent accused of espionage uh, and was acquitted. And sure enough, it was this guy. And we talked, and I said, "Listen, I'm not gonna. I don't want to write your story." He said, "I don't want you to write my story. My story's already been written." But I just thought it would make an interesting premise. And yeah. so, um, so I. I I said I, what I did is I wrote a uh, a story that he helped he helped me to write, but it's not his story. But he helped me to um, uh, with the espionage, with the spy stuff. Oh, and that's I, wonderful. Yeah, I didn't tell my agents that I had these contacts, and I actually in the process of doing this, I met a second guy that worked for the CIA in Moscow in the 1970s. Um, and I, so I asked them to both read it. And so when my agents read the book, my agent called me up and she said, okay, uh, what is going on here? Do you, do, you, <laughs> do you have a secret life? <laughs> do you have a secret life? Is there something? And I, I started laughing. Um, and I was, it should, it was, it was the most fun I ever had writing a novel. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. And such a different thing. I'm going to look forward to that one. I, I kind of um, grew up on like the Tom Clancy, you know, and all of those books. So it's a secret guilty pleasure of mine is a good espionage book. Um, and so with people that are wanting to be able to uh, catch you somewhere in public, do you have any events coming up or anything where you'll be appearing? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm actually going to Africa for three weeks. That's fun. Kind of fun. But when I get back, uh, mid-September is the Pacific Northwest Writers Association's Literary Co Conference. I'll be at that. Uh, I'll be doing a little teaching. I'll be doing speaking. Um, so that's uh, that's in September. That is uh, the 13th through the 16th. And then in uh, October, I will be at the Surrey Writers Conference from um, October 18th to October 23rd. And those well, are my next two things. And and that sounds fun. I've heard that's a great event. It's a great. They're both great conferences. Uh, Surrey is very Canadian, so mm -hmm. uh, they're very very friendly, wonderful people. Uh, PNWA. Uh, I'm on the board there. The really good people put that conference on as well. Sounds like what you, your peeps. It's your yes, people. Um, and with respect to people being able to find out more about your books. Um, you've got a website. It is, what is it? Um, it's is it just Robert it's just robertdagoni.com. It's just all been redone. Uh, um, Thomas and Mercer and Amazon Publishing is just doing a big push. So they've helped my, my editor, my uh, internet person redo the website. Uh, it looks beautiful. It has every, all the information anyone would need on there, including my newsletter. Um, which is very limited. I don't spam people. It's just to kind of let them know when a new book's coming out. Awesome. And if you guys want to know how to spell Dagoni, it's right behind his head. <laughs> there, <laughs> under my sister's grade. D there it is. O N I. Um, and I also wanted to tell you that I got a newsletter the other day and saw your name. You've been up for so many awards, fantastic nominations, um, number one bestseller on Amazon. And now you're up for the Silver Falchion for Mystery, which I, I won last year. So I had to say, go, go, Bob. Good for you. Congratulations. That's dinner this year so I can cheer for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, but, would, that would be a wonderful award. It, it would be. Yeah, but you've been up for some great ones and finalists and nominees already. So uh, you, you kind of already have an impressive resume, my friend. Very Thanks. impressive. Well, I'm going to go ahead then and wrap this up with, with Bob. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening and let you know that this is a copyrighted production of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network because I would be lynched if I didn't do that by Pam Stack, our producer. And, um, Bob, I want to thank you for being part of Wine, Women, and Writing. When I pitched it to you, I'm sure the name, you know, you're thinking, I'm not a woman. Why is this woman asking me to be on her show? But you're perfect for it. Your two characters are perfect for it. I'm sure you love having it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.